Extremely sorry for the delay that uh, that has occurred due to, due to all these problems. I would now call upon Dr. Shabal Gupta to give a welcome speech and uh, start the program. Dr. the Bhakti, Dr. the Dubey, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome and thank on behalf of our friend, Dr. Amir Kumar Bhakti, an economist of international review and presently Director of Centrical Studies in Social Sciences for agreeing to deliver the third foundation lecture. Professor Bhakti needs no introduction to personal intelligence. <laughs> Professor Bhakti has made a notable contribution to the study of economic changes in the country right from the beginning of the century and has of late been engaged in studying the possible fallout of the current state of policy changes. I would like to briefly introduce the background of our three foundation lecture. Ever since our dream was established about three years ago, it has been our endeavor to organize an annual lecture to commemorate our foundation. Parenthetically, I may add, that the formal date of the registration act. In fact, the germination of our dream in the realm of ideas dates back further back. It took more than two years before the idea of Ati could be fully crystallized before its formal foundation. The very concept of Ati was born out of the research agenda 
that agenda of research comes prior to the organizational dimension was the broad theme with which the formation of Adri is intertwined. While the initial research agenda of Adri focuses on Bihar, it would progressively enlarge its scope by undertaking comparative studies of development across the state and other countries in Asia which form a reasonably homogeneous development region. Adri Foundation lecture has become an important landmark in the intellectual life of Patna. It has become a conveyor belt for ideas to travel in the academic and national and international academic preoccupation on crisis of socialism and its future in the Prabhat Patna. Public activities. But more than providing an opportunity for interaction, we have always planned those foundation lectures as a globalization of India, the fantasy and reality is an issue of great contemporary interest in view of the new economic policy on the one hand and just the Indian economy in a fundamental way. Before I conclude, I must thank Mr. M. K. Agrawal, CGM State Bank of India for partly supporting the third foundation lecture on a very short notice. We would reiterate our thanks. I would also like to extend my thanks to Manoj Das, Chief Manager of Indian Bank of India and Journal Manager of Bank of India for supporting the third foundation lecture. I would once again welcome everybody to the third foundation. Our distinguished speaker, Professor Amir Bakshi, and ladies and gentlemen. I, it's a great pleasure that I, I welcome you all to this third Foundation Day lecture of Adi. It's even more pleasure for me to welcome Professor Bakshi amongst us, who has been to partner a number of times before, but this time probably a fairly long gap. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Professor Bakshi does not need an introduction. Uh, ever since his, he has started his academic career, he has been making very valuable contributions to the field of economic analysis in the best possible traditions of political economy, as distinct from other kinds of historical empirical studies with which we seem to be interested to get this kind of business for us. Uh, as for the topic, we have today globalization in India, uh, fantasy and reality. In the current background of economic events that we are passing through, I can't think of a more appropriate topic than this one for Professor Marchi to uh, talk about. Uh, for any policy framework, a debate will be highly desirable. But I'm sure that in, in this case, uh, if you actually adopt this policy, which are so known as today, they, did, they probably did not look uh, in order to be uh, the, uh, the elements of the policy seem to be a little debated between the fact that we have had the policy for three years. We have seen its work, we have some experiences about it, we have some factual evidences about it. Uh, this is an extremely opportunate moment, opportune moment for us to uh, carry forward the debate. As for, as for <coughs> the, even the professional economists, not to talk about the enlightened public or, uh, or uh, inquisitive minds, I must state that uh, the debate is extremely essential because until three years back, no one had even talked about this topic even remotely. If you see the standard literature in economic research, either in the field of academics or in the field of government. Uh, we are talking about very many other things apart from what we are talking about uh, now. When the policy started, all in a sudden we are given the that, uh, that uh, this is good for us and the protagonist needs to place the whole facts in such a manner that in today's discourse we will be having a lot more to learn about the present economic policy and the globalization that we have done until now. So the government, I think one important reason is that uh, when this new facts and figure fact is placed once, the same happens. The problem becomes even more 
complicated when you are seeing international experience in this field. At one point, we are told to have a look at East Asian countries, the countries who have made so much of progress through the process of this, at least a decade back, and then a decade back, than we have done. I have no intention of uh, guessing what Professor Kartki says, not that it is possible for me with my little knowledge, but I hope you realize that how eager all of, all of us are to listen to him about this, uh, the extremely important national economic question that is posed before us. With these words, I again welcome Professor Bakshi. Thank you very much. I will request Professor Bakshi to deliver the apology. My old friends in the audience and all my other new states. I am not entirely new to Patna. Whenever I have come here, somehow or other I have got involved in discussing whatever I was working on with my friends here. And instead of shooting down those tackling our ideas as yet incapable of flying, they have tried to nurture them and encourage me to go on working on some of these things. That is exactly the kind of thing that I have again done today because there are certain kinds of ideas which are ideas that I have been working on recently in order to clarify in my own mind what it means to have a process of globalization used in so many different senses, in so many different contexts. Teachers, proper understanding of the actual events and processes that countries are undergoing in the name of globalization. Therefore, I will adopt a rather formal approach and try to define my terms as I go along. I'll also apologize for something else. That are, you'll find there are too many words ending in shun, commercialization, financialization, globalization. Some of you may be reminded of the quip that CM Anadurai reported to have made about the matriculation examination, which is a botheration and the ultimate fate of that sort of thing should be the Indian Ocean. Now, even if that kind of thought occurs to you in listening to the way I try to explain some of these terms, I will ask your forbearance because these are processes I am trying to understand. And as I they know, not all of them have been really properly delineated in the existing literature. Uh, way of presenting a lecture, that is, I don't generally read out lectures. I'll try and read out some of the things that I have written out because that will help in making the terms more rigorous than has no commonly accepted meaning. Although it is used constantly by politicians, journalists, and academics. As it is applied to an economy and a society, the word might mean the process of connecting it with the world in an in a intricate two-way network of flows of information, trade, finance, productive assets, and people. But they typically still impose severe restrictions on movements of commodities and services and people from less developed countries and do not permit a full and free flow of information to other countries. The process of globalization may be imposed from outside or it may be induced from developments within the country concerned. A typical third world country such as India has globalization imposed on This means that India trade and treats with the advanced market economies on unequal terms. Her rates of investment remain abysmally low. So the internal induction mechanism is throttled. Her industries become triples or dwarfs. 
And what is going on, for example, in the allocation of land for multinational enterprises in the center of India? You know, we have been pleading for land reform, pleading for land to be given to the peasants, pleading for common property resources to be respected, and the government has again and again taken measures to reverse some of this understood. That whether a process can start or go on depends on policy choices made by the rulers, depends on the degree of resistance people can put up against certain consequences of this. Globalization process was deliberately chosen by a subset of the ruling classes. A coalition of internationalized domestic capital and democracy and landlords turned semi-capitalist farmers. May I say that? And the process that we have seen working in full force during the last three years was predicted in that. It will have been classified by most of the major information in the country. That also was a matter of how far the state capital to the disarray and dependence and haphazard neoliberalism. Haphazard because markets are not things which are simply given from above. Markets are also constructed. As any medieval institute would know, any student of Indian history would know, and what is it? But constructed markets are themselves being destroyed in many cases. Let alone social systems, cooperation mechanisms, cross networks. India is being made to enact yet another player. Daniel Defoe's account of British commerce in the early 18th century, or you read Marx's Capital Volume 1, The Destruction of Primitive Accumulation, you will find that all of these are descriptions of trade, commerce, accumulation going beyond the borders of any given country. However, the degree of globalization was contained by resistance from other social formations and by inner contradictions among regions and nations undergoing capitalist change. <laughs> These contradictions, resistances, and the processes of uneven development within regions invaded by capitalism can be eliminated by distinguishing between different moments of eventual globalization. These moments are commercialization, capitalization, internationalization, transnationalization, financialization, and globalization. These moments may or may not, may or may not be distinguishable in particular empirical cases. But in general, you would expect them to behave like successive terms in a sequence which are from time to time interrupted or which may even temporarily change places. These changes in places will generally be caused by two sets of factors. The use of force, or its cessation, or its reversal, and the ebb on and flow of intercapitalist competition. Let me very briefly define the categories we have used. Commercialization is the process of increasing incidence of monetary transactions in the exchange of goods and distribution of income. Capitalization is the conversion of production units themselves into capitalist enterprises, while the employer is the supreme boss. Through the employment of wage labor, capitalist slavery, or other kinds of unfree labor. There was slavery before capitalism, but capitalist slavery is of the kind where labor is used primarily for producing surplus labor. I do not like the term capitalization, for it has other meanings in the context of company balance sheets and stock markets. But the alternative would be to invent a new word, and I do not know a suitable of Greek, uh, suitable Greek or Latin based to find such a word. The internationalization of an economy is the process. If we take the next term, the internationalization is the process of increase in the importance of foreign trade in the production and distribution process. The process of transnationalization, coming to the fourth term, 
is a sustained increase in the direct command over the trans production and distribution processes of the economic by trans and conversion of increasing proportion of the assets of the economy into properties traded on the formal or informal stock market. In this process, traders in assets are rarely long-term owners of the the globalization of the economy that changes when international capital becomes fully mobile, both ways. That is, it comes into and goes out of an economy at frequent intervals in an unrestricted manner. In a globalized economy, however, labor is generally not mobile internationally. Only within Western Europe, some degree of mobility of capital is yet observed, of labor is yet observed but it's still at a preliminary stage of development. You know all the stories of how the Americans are, you know, who are great friends of free trade and free mobility of people, and are restricting the migration of Indian students, not only computer specialists and so on, scientists, social scientists into their country. They are greatly afraid of Asian politics. They don't want to face it in their country. Although all these different processes are moments in the development of capitalism, they are rarely energized only by free choices of free economic agents. Force or coercion have played a role in different countries in the process of commercialization, internationalization, etc. And, and this has happened gradually in all economies at some stage or other of their evolution. In the case of third world economies, of course, force has been a dominant power in unleashing particular processes. In the case of economies which have conspired or aspired to dominance, there has been a tradition of resistance to coercion. And this resistance has been organized around non-market instruments as well as market-related phenomena. When the Japanese wanted to keep out the Americans, they simply fashioned a huge number of so-called non-transparent barriers to trade. They imposed restrictions on particular kinds of standards or independence and a country which is quite happy, or rather the ruling classes of which are quite happy to remain abjectly dependent on foreign capital. The generalization may be hazarded that the role of coercion has been far greater in the so-called third world nations than in the developed countries. And this role has not noticeably gone down from time. In the case of India, forced commercialization may have characterized the marketing of peasant crops even before the onset of British rule. Forced commercialization prevailed wherever money lenders or landlords could dictate the choice of crops or marketing by ordinary peasants because of either debt bounty or because of the exercise of non-market power. But the arena of such forced commercialization could not have been very great because in most, before British rule. Because in most areas of the country, the cultivation of crops or marketing was limited. Discipline of an externally oriented tributary state of pressures and the pressing down of phenomena of state bondage, traditional caste based authority structures, and the state apparatus suffused with racist ideology led to the construction of the colonial plantation enterprise. I talked about force of capitalization. Such enterprises also directly or indirectly influence the enterprises which are set up on the model of an industrializing Britain. Thus we come up against the phenomenon of forced capitalization. Now, somebody might object that in any country, the so-called capitalist enterprises are influenced by the social structures of that country. In Japan, for example, the capitalist enterprise that we see today is very different from the capitalist enterprise that characterized Britain, let us say, in the middle of the 19th century. There are far greater ties of workers to particular companies. Workers are recruited from particular networks, and the qualifications are very often loyalty rather than 
certification from outside agencies. The, in the Indian case, the difference between Japan and India, well, the difference between Japan and Britain is very obvious, but the difference between Japan and India is the following. In the Japanese case, the firms have created networks, particular kinds of networks to suit the demands of the particular part of capital development they have chosen. In the Indian case, we have retained many of the pre-capitalist social relations and allowed the capitalist enterprise to adapt to those social relations without either having the impersonal certification or meritocracy of a British firm or the personalized certification and networking of a Japanese firm. Now these phenomena of post commercialization and along the coast of that sea and the, in, and the Atlantic Ocean into further Europe and into Tibet, Burma, Thailand and China. Along the, the borders of China and Japan. The European incursion disrupted the pattern of this trade and reoriented it towards Europe. And the control of the trade mostly passed from Asian businessmen into the hands of European monopoly companies and other private firms. Throughout the period of British rule, the imperative to send an annual remittance to Britain to satisfy the demands of the British Parliament, the stockholders of the East India Company, and the budgeting civil and military apparatus of the British Government of India in Britain, imposed this correlative compulsion to send out exports in bigger and bigger volumes and values. Because of this imperative, Indian exports always part with the character of a consignment trade. Prices are determined in auction markets. The description of these processes as forced or coerced does not mean that there are no agents in the colonialized society who voluntarily participated in the process. Nor does it mean that there was no resistance by coerced agents against the process. Nor finally, that coerced agents did not have any room for autonomous action. Many Indian merchants collaborated voluntarily with the British in the process of conquest of India itself and continued to survive and even thrive through such collaboration. Many Indian rulers went over to the side of the British at critical points of conflict. Mirjapur deserted Siraj Dola and the Gaipur of Baroda deserted the Peshawa, although nominally he was a commander of Peshawa. The landlords and money lenders collaborated with the British rulers for the major part of colonial rule. On the other side, Pedra resistance was endemic in British India and very often led to revision of British policy in major ways. For example, the resistance against Nilkor cultivation in Bengal maintained a culture of their own in most areas which could only be partially dominated by upper caste and upper class ideology. Moreover, as the colonial system continued through time, changes in international commercial and power relations and changes within Indian society led to new fields of choice and conflict. However, so long as the despotic apparatus of colonialism continued, the basic structures were determined by the system and the policy pursued by the controllers of the system. This means also that even when the outer ramparts of force collapsed, many of the inner sentry posts of wars and remained virtually intact. With the understanding that similar remarks apply to such moments of the globalization process, we can now rapidly delineate the role and nature of force and coercion in the processes of transnationalization, financialization, or securitization, or globalization. In the process of transnational firms, counted by the Investment Survey Report of 1992, are located in the countries. The process of transnationalization of much of Latin America had been extensive already in the 1960s and 70s. Bought out or went bankrupt and the government allowed the transnational firms to take over whole sectors of India. Now Latin America experienced a further dose of transnationalization in the 1980s, when virtually all the countries walked into a debt tax created by loan-pushing transnational banks and complacent governments run by corrupt politicians and bureaucrats. 
you take a Latin American case, and by now that situation would be familiar to people in India. If you take, for example, Mexico's state, about one third of that state is simply the capital that is taken away almost at once after the Mexican government has borrowed it from other countries or from transnational banks. In our country also, a very large part of the so-called foreign investment never really reaches this country. But a lot of it remains stacked away. Now, let me... Uh, Latin America experienced a further dose of transnationalization in the 1980s when virtually all the countries walked into a debt trap created by loan pushing transnationals. I have already said that. In the 1980s, the burden of debt servicing came to take the place of colonial tribute payments in creating an enormous drain of resources from the third world to the first. When the less developed countries became poor in a debt trap, they are forced to undergo a process of financial deregulation on the totally unsubstantiated and false supposition that the interest rate is just the price of loans. Like as, let us say, rupees 60 per kg may be the price of market or the market for market. The point about all that is that all people, except thoroughly dogmatic neoclassical economists, have always known that. Sociologists have known that, economic historians have known that. And now the mainstream economics have theorized about how credit markets are always characterized by rationality. Credit markets by nature must be imperfect. Credit markets by nature have to have some kind of regulation built into the system. And here are the IMF and World Bank employing some of the best professionals in the world our government employing some of the best professionals in this country, preaching a doctrine as if they have never heard of trade rationing, they have never heard of the necessary imperfection of trade markets, they have never heard of public intervention in order to correct the, some of the imperfections in the interest of public interest. And so the, very often the debt of many countries came to form a large fraction of the total assets that were marketable in that country. Large chunks of LDC real estate, LDC organizations with enormous reservoirs of skill were then auctioned off in the so-called take for equity swap. Of course, since these enormously valuable assets were sold in displaced and totally imperfect markets, the less developed countries remained as indebted as before. They had borrowed away, they had bartered away their land and destroyed decade long efforts at building of skills and manufacturing competence. This is happening with many of our manufacturing enterprises today. The imports have reduced on the entry of foreign direct investment into their countries. The South Koreans, even when they were borrowing from the Americans, they are given, being given the largest blocks of military and economic aid, were able to implement the Japanese-style law which said that in any company, a South Korean must be either a president or the chief executive director of the company and the shareholding must be such as to permit such a situation. That in any contract, for example, I and mean, this is again very German in the light of what is being said about Enron and Bechtel taking over most of the chunks of construction of power plants in this country. In any contract, the prime contractor in any construction project, the prime contractor must be a South Korean company. And, and this, these are some of the things that are hidden from the public eye. These are at the level of the overall macroeconomic management policies. But of course, the South Koreans also adopted certain other policies, which this government or previous government have never adopted fully. South Koreans, under various restrictions, have fully you know, peasant-oriented land reform program, and that there are no landlords left in that country. Communist revolution earlier on, American fear of a communist revolution, and so on. And the desire of the South Korean government genuinely to industrialize the country, all went together into these policies. So this cluster of policies were adopted by them, and there are severe restrictions. Nobody could import any currency bread on a free quota island, and people lost jobs and were arrested, the jail and the charge that they were possessed for in 
I'm not asking our country to adopt such draconian measures in these cases. But this is the sort of thing that went on. They are not models of free trade, lack of public intervention and so on. The question to a situation of haphazard neoliberalization. The, the basic reasons lay in the two sets of factors. One was the lack of genuine nationalism among the major capitalist groups in India. There are exceptions, but they fail to network in a nationalist manner. That Indian is the best. It was not, never a slogan in the Indian capitalist. Whereas in Japan, Yamato, the supremacy of Japan in every field, was a credo of the nature. British is best, of course, was the slogan of the British are rising on, on the crest of the West. And the second part was that the basic social requirements, the requirements for upgrading the human skills, these are never attempted in the Land reforms are not carried out, people are not educated, social insurance policies are not put in place, and all kinds of excuses are given for not doing it. And they are still being given for not doing it. So, so the whether an import substitution process succeeds or not does not depend simply on getting prices right or wrong, but depends on a whole cluster of other policies and, you know, uh, and structures that are put in the country. In most of the late developed countries, the sequence of introduction of moments of capitalist evolution was imposed by pressures from outside. Most of them meaning outside is pressure. I mean, what I have said about South Korea would apply also to today's China. China again is not an example. Today, the fastest growing large economy in the world is not an example of a free trade nation. It's an example of a nation which has used socialist structures to build capital, but not an example of a country which is, you know, under country was not made by internal development. Although at almost every state, indigenous collaborators could be found as the junior partners or as cheerleaders for the particular path imposed by the colonial power or the dominant block of international capital. This applies to the introduction of railways, for example, to take one very good example. Railways schemes are thought of by capitalists like Darakana Tagore, like Rustam Kawaji Banaji. And they put for out these programs. But they were executed by British companies. They simply remained as the, as let us say, as the, uh, as the Nokibs, the Nokibs who announced the arrival of India. But the new age was created by others. Uh, uh, except in Bombay, and to some extent in the state of Madras, with Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, the levers of international trade remained in European hands. And the lever, again, except in Bombay and Ahmedabad up to 1914, large-scale capitalist enterprise meant European enterprise. The period from 1947 to, say, 1975 was the phase in which Indian capital sought some autonomy of action and was heavily subsidized by the state in the process. But the social and political preconditions for such autonomous choice were not built on the ground. The vast majority of workers remained illiterate and ill-fed. Landlords and local liquids continued to exert non-market power and impede all productivity raising initiatives. And the indigenous capitalist process failed to evolve a technological or organizational trajectory of their own. For those who are in but now I don't have to remind them that the Koshi project remained for a very long time underutilized. Pradhan Prasad had written about this and others have written about this because of the opposition of the landlords to the utilization of the irrigation water by the peasants. There may be an Indian path to capitalism. You know, Thomas Simbard has written about that, claiming that there is a specifically Indian path. But there, there is as yet no sign of an Indian path to an internationally competitive 
or socially responsive or technologically vibrant capitalism. Globalization seeks to short circuit the process imposed globalization, that is, seeks to short circuit the process of building either self generating, decentralized, and internationally sustainable social democratic order or an internationally competitive system with the dual responsibility of the capitalists to invest in the continuous upgradation of skills of workers and of workers to serve a process of productivity growth and of the scientists and technologists to generate new technologies adopted, adapted to the skills and organizational needs of the Indian workers and of productive enterprises on the other hand to use those technologies as paths to innovation and adaptation of technologies. The proportion of Indian private investment in R&D remained throughout stagnant at around 10% of the total national figure, which is a, was again never more than 1% in a, you know, many of these figures are just water, just quality control, sort of rooms, guest houses, pretending to be, you know, uh, R&D setups. But even taking these into account, they never amounted to more than 10% of the total national R&D effort. Whereas again in South Korea, beginning from a level of zero, private R&D effort now accounts for the major part of the total national effort, and that is now more than one, much more than one percent of total national effort. Now, but such short circuiting can only further postpone or suppress the restructuring of society and economic organization while only increasing the dominance of international finance and capital on the Indian economy. The reorientation of the Indian economy is so, so as to make it viable in the context of unbridled international capitalism, whose only mechanism of co coordination is the capital of G7 countries, demands numerous micro levels. The structure of management of many of the arthritic, bureaucratically managed private and public enterprises has to be rendered less hierarchical. More, responsi more responsibility has to be given to shop floor workers and supervisors. Durable suppliers, users, relationships have to be built up between different farms. Durable networks of trust have to be built up between financing institutions and uh, the productive enterprises. Firm monitoring devices have to be put in place between financial institutions and the borrower firms. Workers have to be better trained, better educated, better paid and better housed for them to be able to perform an intelligent, pro as intelligent problem solvers rather than as just substitute automata on the top floor. Factor markets have to perform so as to channel labor capital and technology into their best interest. But all this requires more investment in education, more public provisioning, in <coughs> more investment in science and technology, and of course, in the productivity of units themselves. Such stepping up of investment cannot take place in a situation where demand is stagnant, workers and managers are demoralized, and an enormous fraction of total resources is drained away to meet repayment obligations on old loans and the guaranteed profit on transnationals such as Enron and Vector. The less resources the national decision makers can control, the more vulnerable they become to arm twisting by transnational banks, other transnational corporations, the IMF World Bank, DUO, and the governments of the G7 countries. What I have styled macroeconomic capability in an, another context and microeconomic restructuring of the kind that I have sketched about are intimately related to one another. The mobility of the, the uh, uh, the ability and the reverse to, in the reverse direction the choice of strategies which are only imposed by the needs of other countries will increase further the cost of earning. 
India had undergone colonial internationalization and predatory commercialization. Predatory commercialization because predation takes place by using both market and non-market power. It is not a commercialization which grows or continuous. You know, forced commerce in the in case of agriculture has been studied, but in the case of artificial words also this kind of process goes on all the time. Now it is undergoing what I have said, premature financialization and debt induced globalization. We would not have adopted these policies if we had not been in 1991 on the point of defaulting on our debt. And that position, as I have said, had been more or less planned for by the policymakers in 1985. A pattern of globalization which is dictated by the needs of a dominant but declining capitalist power, namely the United States, cannot allow India to become the vibrant, globally competitive economy whose image has been dangled before us by the policymakers. Instead of that, we will have an economy and a society continually threatening to fall apart under the uneven spread of the moments of capitalism that have been identified as. So, you know, I have been very snappish in the presentation of this, but it is important to recall this not only of our own country, but of the other countries, to learn from the successes of other countries as well as from the failures of this country. If we have to imitate the social structures or the strategies of foreign countries, it is not to the United States that we should move. The United States is the dominant capitalist power in the world. Its dominance is declining, but it is still the country which attracts enormous amounts of capital. It is also a country which is driven by violence, the levels of violence in every major city of the United States are still unimaginable. The number of murders per thousand people in the cities like Detroit or Chicago is about 18 to 20 times the number of murders even now in desperately poor cities like Calcutta or not so poor cities like Madagascar. The fact that the president of the South Korea has monthly meetings on economic problems of the uh, country and these monthly meetings also decide the export levels that are to be targeted by the country is a relevant fact. But much more important is the fact that by now 90% or more of the South Koreans are literate as against you know, barely, I don't know what is the current figure. People say 34, 35, 40, but when you actually check at the lowest levels, the degree of illiteracy is far greater than you had originally imagined. The fact that, you know, through growth, through small peasant farming, the South Koreans were able to feed themselves better than the Indians long way back in the early 1960s. That the male-female literacy differences, that they are also in that country, the females are also discriminated against in East Asia, but they are discriminated against in different ways, not through the killing of infants in childhood. If we cannot change these policies, these basic social policies, and cannot change the use of arbitrary power, non-market power, private power, for settling you know, disputes which should be a matter of public as you know. In that case, we have to say goodbye to any hope of a really competitive economy which can stand on its own legs, can get free of foreign dominance, can provide for employment in this country, and all that. How long will that take is something that one can talk about. But certainly, this kind of globalization imposed from above has already caused enormous havoc. For example, the stock market scam was not an accident. It was predictable. In June 1991, again, if I may say so, I had written an article predicting that stock market would get into disarray unless something like the Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States is put into place as soon as there is deregulation of the financial markets. Because even with the Securities and Exchange Commission, we have seen how in the United States so many scandals have taken place and 
And these people, the people who are considered once financial wizards, have been there since the jail one after another. Michael Milken, Ivan Boisky, and the list is a very long one. Now, now, these are not accidents. We already know this. It is not a matter of speculation. It is a matter of empirical generalization from evidence of both successes and failures from other countries. It is a matter of deduction on the basis of the theory of information, asymmetric information and agency. The, the government of <coughs> economists and the IMF World Bank economists are all the time trying to forget not only the lessons of Keynes, Kaleski, all the attempts at building a social democracy in Europe and other countries, but also the lessons of the best practitioners of their own profession in, in today's world. And this is where I think it is very important to all the time nail down the fantasy that the government is dangling before us as fantasy, as ghosts that have to be dispelled as just as you dispel the fear of a child for the you know, shadows she has seen on the wall as it was. And bring us back to the perception of the reality that India is facing and will face in that coming future, unless the policies, the strategies, the social relations, the economic structures can be radically revised. Uh, I'll stop here. I'm sure uh, I have left many terms unexplained, and some of you will feel that I have introduced unnecessary terms in some cases. My excuse for doing that is that it is necessary to understand the evolution of capitalism itself, the phases to which it has gone, in order to understand India's situation within that global capitalist network, and to try to determine how we should position ourselves in that in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bakshi, for the, the very high, high... John Miller case had made an observation. I'm going to quote that observation. Quote, I would like to have your visit. I, I sympathize, therefore, with those who would minimize rather than those who would maximize economic enlargement between nations. Ideas, knowledge, Art, hospitality, travel, these are the things which should, of their nature, be internationalized. But let goods be home spun whenever it is reasonably and conveniently possible. And above all, let finance be primarily national on foreign countries, particularly on foreign institutional investors for operation on Indian stock exchange. Number two, permitting preferential allotment of shares and majority control. The subject matter of the speech was globalization, fantasy, and this. I think we have heard only one part, the fantasy, not the idea. The second point is that all these terms, Globalization, financialization, liberalization, and this kind of Then how about this nationalization? The same sort of nationalization also? Rationalization also? Thirdly, it has to share that allocation of land to the only nationals and multinationals. The land is never allocated to any foreign nation. It is allocated to industry. It goes with that. If they don't survive, then somebody else <coughs> My learned speaker has had so much to say about other countries, has not spoken anything about the socialist battle of the government, the socialist government, and the other question, yes. 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 Yes.
Uh, the reason I'm here, that I've been in the last 15 years in different parts of the world and I had interaction with people from developed countries, people from developing countries, and underdeveloped countries. I feel that Indians are a good performer all over the world. And the success of Indians in North America and Europe is a story which their people, their leaders have to see the India that comes with one suitcase. Today they own a big villa and a big business. I've seen in the Middle East where is a melting point of all the nationalities. And the Middle East, whether it's the airport or the banking system, is being run smoothly and efficiently by Indian or Pakistani. Emirates is one of the best carriers today. And the whole Dubai, whether it's a um, duty-free shop or the vigilance or anywhere in the airport, it is the Indians or uh, the Pakistanis are working. And it is much better than New York or Heathrow. Why we Indians are lacking behind? Globalization doesn't mean that we are only looking forward for multinationals to come back to come to India. I think there are people, I have talked personally to poor Africans from Tanzania, Nigeria, Ghana, and everywhere. They said that when India got independent in early childhood, we thought that India is going to bring insulation, liberate us from the Western countries, from the white race. But they feel very sorry what's happening today in India. I think globalization means we compete with them. The example of South is Latin America, I think it's because they didn't get up and compete with them but they just made the mess of the whole state coming and we can corrupt the uh, structure of the political structure. Uh, I can see that the, in African countries, they are looking for Indian goods, Indian industry going there. And I've seen a good example of roads built in South, Saudi Arabia, with a subcontract with the Indian contractor from the Madras, the, the chief contractor from Italy. And that road is one of the examples of the good road I just ask what is what is the fault in our system where we cannot stand and compete with the rest of the developers? Yes. Learning lecture, no doubt, went along with established that liberalization policy based on certain fantastic assumptions. My simple question is that whether actually this liberalization should be ruled out in totality or certain rationed doors of liberalization required to open up our economy, whether our door, a window, or ventilator should be open. <coughs> ਮੈਂ <laughs> मसले कुछ क्षेत्रों में या कुछ नेताओं की सामाजिक राजनीतिक प्राथमिकताएं उन आर्थिक आर्थिक प्राथमिकताओं से मेल नहीं खाती जो दृष्टि से इसको ध्यान में रखकर बनते हैं जैसे एक साधारण सा इसका उदाहरण है कि हमारे यहां जो आरक्षण की नीति हो रही है तो वह आर्थिक नीति के साथ समन्वय समन्वय रख लिया जाए जैसे हम निजी क्षेत्र को प्राथमिकता दे रहे हैं जबकि हमारी आरक्षण नीति सरकारी नीति है तो क्या हमारी नई आर्थिक नीति हमारी सरकारी नीतियों से समन्वय रख रही है या नहीं to the issue of economic framework. And uh, what apparently seems to be fueling the fantasy aspect is also seems a cultural imperialism um, that's on the back of economic sort of position. So is there a possibility of creating any critical framework to which one could assess the kinds of forces through cultural media that's been sort of imposed on India? Uh, The question is, in this age of globalization, are we completely excluding the possibility of bilateral impact? I think this will continue. And in that eventuality, 
what is going to be the status of countries like India? Yeah, coming off, that's happened. Even up in the 70s and 60s. That is not the question. That is not the point at all. And there are Indian technologists and scientists, very good ones, here, abroad. That is not at all the thing. One has to ask that the question of liberalization, etc., is being raised now. Point that is being made is the following. That is only because of lack of freedom of trade that Indian traders and Indian technologists, Indian scientists, Indian entrepreneurs could not make India into a vibrant country. This is false. This is false. There is no historical evidence for it. And there is no contemporary evidence for it. I am sorry to say I am not interested by your station. Let me talk about it. They, they, can't, they, they just talked about socialism. What else is socialism? A minimum dignity. Employment uh, insurance for workers on which most of the private industrialists in this part of the country have cheated. And they have not been jailed. They have gone out to scot free. What else is socialism? Giving more jobs for the middle class boys in the public sector enterprises. That was social. It was half hearted state captains that I talked about. That is not social. But the hypocrisy that virtue pays to vice that was there in the talk of socialist pattern, that hypocrisy is now taken away. And in its, in its state, we have the you know, raw face of international capital. So that part, that is also, I think, taken care of. I'll come to the really difficult questions now, I think. Uh, well, there is also another difficult question. And that will lead me to the most difficult one. That is, should we add completely abolish liberalization? No. We ha will have to restructure Many of our enterprises will have to have new kinds of relations. We'll have to put pressure on capitalist public enterprises in order to do that. And some degree of international competition there will be. But it should be the degree of liberalization that we choose. The pace of it is something that we choose. We deliberately set out actual policies, not just talk about the national renewal fund and then forget about it. Pay attention to doing that. Instead of, you know, how you just look at the proportion of time our top politicians spend in enclaves in Narora, enclaves in what, Surajkund and then so on. The proportion of time they spend just on politically. Just seeing, you know, who gets a little ahead and in, in the race and who gets a little behind. And how much they actually attention they pay to production to distribution, you know, how are enterprises going to be a little better. I will give you an example, <coughs> where I have seen one single man who had confidence of the department make an enormous difference. The power minister was famous. He is a first class electrical engineer, he was a professor, could get the confidence of the people working in the state electricity board and has really effected a turnaround. He doesn't spend time politically. And wh what do they do? They, they just, most of the time, walk, you know, jockey for another crore of rupees here, another crore of rupees there for their private pockets or for their party funds, and go on merrily and talk about grandly about liberalizing the economy. Liberalization, if you read the history of Japan, the construction of Japan, New Japan, after the major destruction, it was a long, arduous process where the policy makers actually went to the forums and saw how it was to be done. All this has been written about, and most of our politicians can read and write. Now, the difficult part comes with the quotation from Keynes and so on. That's difficult. My own view is, this is a humble view, that Keynes was always a creature of his time. For him, the short run was the only one. And Britain, after all, had just ceased to be the dominant nation in the world. 
He was talking about Europe at that time, where he was seeing unemployment being exported from one country to another through bigger and bigger policies. And it is in that context we are talking about that. Now the coordination of international capitalism is a much more difficult process. It is true that top decision makers in the international economy are not even attempting that. They are not attempting that partly because I think the Americans do not have the confidence anymore that they will remain on top. They want to make hay while the sun still shines for them. Let the rest of the world economy go hand. That is how it is happening. But even if this were not so, I think they would have to accept it that the number of technologies that have been innovated since Keynes' day is enormous. And the revolution of in information technology has made it impossible for countries not to network with one another. And therefore, it is necessary to have international networking in many different ways. But absolutely true that international, neither internationally nor nationally, finance can be allowed to call that tune. One can say that there has been a throughout the history of capitalism. There has been a continual conflict between finance and productive enterprise. In the case of the Netherlands, when finance got the better of everything, the Dutch, from being the top nation of Europe, became one of the you know poorest nations. It took them a long century or more in order to come back to equality of with Belgium or France, let alone Britain. And similarly, with the United States, I think financial liberalization has been one of the worst of the US economy in the long run. That is quite true. But how to rein in finance? And the countries which have continued to do well in this are countries which now have not gone for financial revaluation on full scale. In Japan and Germany, you can still borrow on particular purposes at rates as low as 2.5%. And this would not be possible in a fully financially deregulated economy. And these are countries which have done better than most other economies in this period. So, but it is a it is a much more difficult process than it was even in cases. Even cases genius was not enough to forge an international monetary fund which would really serve the purpose that he thought was paramount. It was completely subverted into a different form. But now it will be far more. But you can think about it. Uh, then I come to questions of bilateral. Yes, I think you know one of the things that we have missed all through is the possibility of trying to get into bilateral bargaining positions with countries like China and Japan. We have been far too dependent on the United States IMF power bank. Absolutely, I am quite agree that you know the scope for bilateral bargaining. It's still very great. You can easily see it in the, you know, in the very arduous, very acrimonious debates that go on between China and the United States, uh, Japan and the United States, and so Europe and the United States. Although the Uruguay Treaty has been, the GATT Treaty has been signed, most of the now we have question of internationalism and nationalism. You see the, let me say, make the humanist standpoint. I don't think in the long run there should be national values. As just a member of the human race, I don't believe in any ineluctable barriers between regional, let us say, territories. You can build up different cultural profiles without necessarily those cultural profiles coming into violent conflict with one another. You know, that there is Shakespeare with one kind of poetry does not prevent a Rohinna Tagore from coming up with another kind of poetry. And it is that kind of enrichment that we should talk about. And eventually that enrichment will lead to a situation where there are no nations. But that is, is still very far ahead, but it can dream. Uh, social policy and the market. Yes, you see, that is one of the points that People who talk about capital in, a, in the neoclassical mode try to forget. Human beings are not like commodities. 
it is not a it is not a commodity like apples or potatoes and so on. Human beings are peculiar factor of us. If you want a theoretical sort of expression, Karl Polanyi wrote about the you know fictitious factors like human beings that to be made into commodities, but they don't, don't remain commodities. They remain human beings with their particular demands. And when a society imposes inequality, which cannot be negotiated by the market mechanism, then you have then these positivist policies. These policies favoring particular groups. This has happened in the United States, as with the blacks. This uh, happened in Italy, as between the Southerners and Northerners. And in our country, this is happening with various kinds of caste groupings. I mean, it's, it's an attempt to redress millennia old injustice. It cannot be redressed that way. Because we need, it, you know, equality ultimately. Uh, if there is no equality, then as, as I was saying, people will seek equality. If they can't get equality in justice, they will seek equality in injustice. That's what happens. Then finally, I have a question of cultural imperialism. Yes, I quite agree. I mean, a part of the media hype about markets, free markets, etc., is part of cultural imperialism. This is, I mean, a deliberate attempt. The CNN becomes the interpreter of the Galpoa. The, you know, 80,000 Iraq, Iraqi soldiers buried in the sand are believed only when the CNN then broadcast it to the world. A fact is not a fact until the you know, media proclaimed it to be a fact. And that cultural imperialism is imposed not only on us, but on the day. But this, is, this has been one of the most potent instruments of retaining of American dominance, in, even when they have lost their prowess in many fields of manufacturing. That while the Japanese build the hardware for color TV, the Americans provide all the programs. And, you know, so this is something of which we have to be conscious. And just fighting markets cannot be a matter of fighting with you know, prices and quantities. It has also to be a you know, conscious attempt at creating, preserving, uh, in, well, enriching our own cultures without getting into cultural chauvinism. Uh, well, I don't know whether I have answered all the questions. I am quite sure I have been unfair to some of the questioners. So please forgive me. Thank you. Inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to interact again with uh, at least minimally with uh, my old and new friends in Thank you very much. Uh, thanks once again, uh, Professor Amiko Bakshi, on behalf of our brief for his brilliant lecture. I think uh, these moments come. Uh, uh, not too frequently uh, in uh, our life, and we are very grateful that uh, it did come in the way it did, and uh, uh, we as a ministry benefited from it. I don't think that this is an occasion when I should reflect uh, another lecture on you. Uh, so it is therefore very difficult for me to add anything to what has been said. But I will just make uh, a few remarks uh, uh, by way of uh, concluding the meeting. Uh, uh, I think that talking about globalization, uh, there is no doubt that uh, uh, there is no, it is not inevitable because if it were inevitable then, uh, you know, then all the aspects of the economy would be credible. And uh, during the course of the Uruguay round, as uh, you know that uh, uh, the main difference between the European community and uh, America was not only on agriculture, but at, at one point of time, it was on culture. Uh, when uh, de Gaulle said that uh, uh, making concessions on films uh, would amount to losing the, uh, you know, the essence of the French culture. Uh, and this shows that uh, uh, even among the developed countries, uh, globalization cannot be complete, uh, let alone between developed uh, and developing countries. Uh, but it is true that uh, uh, its sweep today is uh, very powerful and it is uh, uh, very difficult for any country to insulate itself uh, totally from uh, this movement. 
Uh, what is really important is uh, the extent of globalization, the nature of globalization, whether it is the, the conditions in which globalization takes place, whether it is by choice or whether it is imposed, as uh, Professor Bhatia Vedaki pointed out. I think uh, uh, in the process of globalization, uh, the uh, many other uh, instruments have been used and harnessed. And I regard uh, you go around of trade negotiations as a very important means uh, for promoting globalization. Uh, and this is very clear from uh, the provisions of the trims uh, and the trips and the services, and uh, particularly uh, about the patenting of seats. Uh, because in the trims, uh, uh, basically uh, a country cannot impose restrictions with regard to the uh, use of uh, local material or with regard to use of uh, local uh, personnel. And similarly in trips, uh, uh, there is a, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole thing is designed to uh, allow uh, the technological domination uh, of the transnational corporations who hold most of the patents in the world. And in services, the uh, once you agree upon the regulation, then there cannot be any imposition on the number of transactions on the amount of money that can flow out. Our own final document was adopted. Uh, there is now a move to, and today, uh, as you know, that uh, there is a trend to bring uh, uh, trade, the, the some aspect of. I think that in our own country, uh, as Professor Bakshi has very rightly pointed out, uh, what we are witnessing today is uh, what happened in uh, uh, the, uh, the Asian, Asian tigers, both the new and old tigers and what is happening here. Because in the Asian, among the Asian targets, including China, uh, there was a no, long process of structural change. Uh, the, uh, you know, basic uh, establishing an egalitarian basis of society, removing social stratification, uh, the, the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the level which savings in these countries have reached. Uh, in savings in most of these countries, is anything between 35% to 55%. Whereas savings in our country are stagnating at about around 20-21%. And recently there has been a decline. And then in the human resources area, uh, they had gone really very, very far uh, before the liberalization started. Particularly in literacy, in providing uh, uh, health for all. And uh, this is uh, the main difference. And I think that if uh, liberalization is going to, fa is going to fail, in case it fails, it, if globalization, uh, we are going to regret what steps we have taken, it will be mainly because of this factor. Uh, and then Professor Baxi has pointed out that uh, it is not only, uh, you know, the uh, putting the card before the horse, but uh, in the attempt to globalize and liberalize, uh, sidetracking the real issue, sidetracking the issue of uh, restructuring and social change. Now, on the foreign policy side, uh, there is clearly uh, in evidence uh, a certain degree of erosion of sovereignty. And that erosion has taken place uh, not only because of what has happened under the Uruguay, uh, losing our voice in international forums. The, our extreme sensitivity to what uh, uh, the more powerful nations will think if we take a particular stand on particular issues. Today at a time when uh, uh, serious attempts, we don't have a blueprint, we don't have a plan, uh, we don't have an idea of our own. And we are just uh, sitting back, lest uh, our initiative will be misunderstood and come in the way of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the manner in which we are trying to uh, restructure our industry. And this uh, and uh, the way the U.S. has become a factor in our relations with neighbors. Uh, we have come to a point where we can't deal with our neighbors directly. And if, if anything happens between us and our neighbor, our first uh, uh, instinct is to rush to the United States, like an urchin, and to say that, look, uh, he has done this thing to me, and please declare him, uh, you know, uh, as a terrorist country, and we are being good uh, about it. 
rather than working ourselves to a position where we can deal directly with our neighbor. Uh, so th this is the uh, theme that has taken place. Now, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, I just wanted to mention one thing about the debt equity swap about which uh, Professor Bakshi referred to. Uh, when Mr. Mahbubul Haq was in India, I think uh, last year, to launch the 1963 Human Development Report, uh, one of the points that he made was that uh, in, in India does not have resources for social development and we are likely to mobilize resources uh, through usual means, that is raising revenue or cutting expenditure. So the only way in which India can now raise resources uh, for social development is to swap its debt. Uh, uh, that is to uh, sell its debt uh, at discounted value in the market, get uh, money out of it, and then spend it for social development. And he said it in two public meetings, and there was not a whisper from the Ministry of Finance, either from the Finance Minister or from the Finance Secretary. And uh, now I, I will leave you to you to derive your own conclusion. And does it mean that India has also reached a stage uh, in its uh, uh, problem of indebtedness where we are prepared to transfer real resources to foreign multinationals in lieu of reducing a part of our debt budget. Uh, uh, what they, uh, you know, it's something which has been done recently by, by Mexico, by Philippines, by Venezuela. In the way some of the, uh, you know, the real basic strategic industries uh, and the assets in those industries have literally been handed over. To, to, to foreign enterprises uh, for uh, bringing about 5%, 10% reduction in their debt, debt burden. Now, I think that uh, choice before us is very clear. And the choice is that uh, whether we want to become uh, a strong, resilient, self-reliant, self-respecting and proud nation, uh, but uh, not uh, hoping to be uh, prosperous overnight, uh, prosperity comes only with hard labor, as it happened in the case of Japan and in other countries. Or we want to become subservient, meek, uh, voiceless, soulless, but uh, prosperous in a short term. This is the choice before us. Uh, uh, us and I think that uh, uh, it is for uh, uh, a country to decide. Uh, the second choice uh, is uh, may turn out to be only a political choice. Because even if you want to uh, opt for the second choice, it may not really come about. Uh, so the, the whole issue is that whether we should not uh, still hold the brake, not to take off the brake from the engine of our economy and just uh, uh, either crash or hope for the best. Uh, uh, secondly, that we go in for globalization, but there should be an element of selective delinking, as I would point out. In the sense that in areas where we think that we can develop uh, resilience technologies of our own, which would give a distinctive character to our economy, uh, we should deliberately deal with the rest of the world and uh, develop our technology quietly and uh, hold our own in, in, in before the world. Because our recent experience has so shown that we have made breakthroughs mainly in areas where we have uh, thank Professor Bakshi very much on behalf of Abri on behalf of all of you. Thank you. I would uh, request Professor Mutkun Dube to give us one token on behalf of Parthi. I want to thank all of you for uh, being with us so patiently, even through the initial heat and then through this uh, long and uh, stimulating lecture. I also thank our sponsors who have uh, made this occasion possible. State Bank of India, the Times of India, and the Bank of India.